Welcome to evening worship here at Broadway Baptist Church. So glad you and your family are able to join us tonight. It is uh, first Sunday here in June. God is certainly working. We're having a mighty move by the Lord. And I know that the Lord has a message for you. And what we're going to be looking at tonight, which I think is so important in our spiritual lives, is whether or not our repentance is real. God calls us to turn from our old life, to repent from our sins, and to turn towards Him. Is there any sin? Is there anything in your spiritual life that you are struggling with? Just habitual, old sin. And you want to see a spiritual breakthrough in your life for that. Well, you have come tonight. You have tuned in tonight. You're listening to our podcast. You're watching on YouTube or you're watching our Facebook channel about what it means to turn from our sin and turn to Christ. In fact, that is biblical salvation. The very first sermon, John the Baptist came preaching. He called the people in the Jordan River, in the wilderness, to repent and believe and turn away from their sins. And he baptized them, a baptism of repentance. Jesus then comes along shortly after John the Baptist, and he's calling people too to repent for the kingdom of God is near. And it was certainly near because Jesus was right there. The kingdom of God is near here. Every day we're getting closer to meeting Jesus. Could you imagine standing in front of the Lord, preparing to meet Jesus, and He asked you why you didn't trust in the Lord to repent? Why didn't you, why did you, why did you continue with that bitterness, continue with that anger, continue to hold that grudge when Christ is calling you to forgive? When Christ is saying, get rid of it, eliminate it from your life. So many of us are dealing with ongoing addictions and problems. And the Lord, and it might be an indwelling sin, the Lord knows. The Lord knows our hearts. The Lord knows our thinking. And He wants us to have a clean heart, clean hands, and a clean mind. In any area that is not, that there's immorality, impurity, we are called to turn from it many ways, the, our failure to repent prevents us from experiencing spiritual growth. Do you want to experience spiritual growth? Do you want Christ to do a great work in your life? Well, this, is, this, is, uh, the, this is our solution here. We are in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 9, verse 13. We're going through the ten plagues. Remember what's going on here. Moses stands and goes before Pharaoh. Let my people go. They want to worship me in the wilderness. They need to go for a spiritual retreat, a renewal. Maybe you are in need of a spiritual retreat, a spiritual renewal. You need a Mount Sinai experience. You need time to get away from so much pollution in your life and just get alone with God. And that's what we see right here. So I'm going to read this here, and then we're going to look at it, and we're going to see the example of Pharaoh, of how he did not repent. You know, one of the neat things, one of the interesting things about the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us that whenever we are tempted, when we are, when we are facing temptation, the Lord always provides a way out. Meaning, you do not have to yield, you do not have to give in, you do not have to succumb to temptation. There's always a side door, there's a back door. You can turn your back and go the other way and say, this isn't for me. I don't need to be talking to this person. I don't need to respond. And sometimes ignore, run away, get away, change the channel, get off the computer, get off the phone, whatever it takes, you've just got to do it. Empty promises, fake and false commitments do not help your spiritual life. Christ is calling you. He's speaking to you to turn to the Lord. Verse 13, Then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh. Tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, Let my people go so that they may worship me. You know, I saw a quote from Adrian Rogers, one of my favorite preachers. He passed away about 15, 16 years ago. And it says, If your faith can't even get you up in the morning and come to church, and make the effort to come in to God's house in the morning. What on earth makes you think your faith 
is going to get you into heaven. If you can't get to church based on your faith, how are you going to get to heaven based on your faith? And that's such a great point. Because early in the morning, God called Moses, says it's time to get up, and you're going to pilgrim before Pharaoh, and in my, he's going, you're, going to give, you're going to tell Pharaoh my words. God is speaking to Moses. He's speaking to you. He's calling you to take action on your, on your, on your faith. You know, Moses is obe- obeying the Lord. It would have been easy saying, God, the first six times this man has ignored me. I don't know where we're going. I'm a laughing stock. The people aren't happy. The whole Egypt at this point is destroyed. Why on earth are we having to play these games? Lord, just kill all the people. Just let the people go. I'm sure Moses is getting frustrated. Aaron's frustrated. Moses' brother, the spokesman. Pharaoh's beyond frustrated. So we're just not getting any progress here. So we're going we're gonna to go for round number seven. For this time, I'm about to send all my plagues against you, your officials and your people. Then you will know that there is no one like me on the whole earth. By now, I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague, and you would have been obliterated from the earth. However, I have let you live for this purpose, to show you my power and to make my my name known on the whole earth. And the reason why, if you remember a few chapters earlier, the very first time Moses went to Pharaoh and says, let my people go, Pharaoh asked the question, who is the Lord, and why should I listen to him? Why should I obey the Lord? Gosh, what a question, folks, here today. You go and tell somebody what the Bible says. You go quote scripture to the average man driving by our church this evening right now. They will ask that question. Why on earth should I listen to the Bible? Why should I, a lost man here in Lexington, Kentucky, here in, in the center of the so-called Bible Belt, which I question if that's true, Hey, maybe in other parts of the state, but not here in Lexington. There's a lot of folks that do not know biblical truth. What is the Bible Belt? Bible Belt means there's a cultural knowledge of Christianity. And the problem with that is it doesn't, it's not here right now. You have folks who do not know the Lord. They do not know Jesus. They do not know about how to be saved. And what happens here? Just like Pharaoh He's saying, who is the Lord? Why should I listen to him? You quote scripture, that is the, almost the answer you get. People yawn, they almost laugh and go, man, that is just, that is so old school. And we are living in the days of Pharaoh. We're living in Egypt. Egypt was oblivious to the Lord. It was a wicked place. And Christ is calling you and I Just like Moses, you go and you stand and you are going to be different than all of the rest of Egypt. So when we get to that question here, in verse 17, you are still acting arrogantly against my people by not letting them go. Tomorrow at this time I will rain down the worst hell that has ever occurred in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. I'll never forget the worst hell storm I've ever been in. It was right after, it was in March of 2011. We were living in Moreland, Georgia at that time, and we had this Annie Armstrong tea party for a women's ministry event. And it seemed like I was up there for something, I don't know, picking the kids up or helping clean up. It was after it was over. And we headed home, and we got home. And I had literally been home about two minutes. And you could start to see when I got home uh, that this is probably, this is like a Saturday afternoon that all of a sudden uh, a, a cloud was coming over. It looked like it was about to rain. Well, two minutes later, it was pouring down hell. Everybody says it was baseball, golf ball. I don't know if it was golf ball size hell, but they were large, very large pebblets. And it um, destroyed the car hood. It destroyed our roof. I mean, it didn't rip off shingles, but it destroyed like the barbecue grill. It just put dents in everything all over the place. Even at the church, uh, they had to get a new roof. Literally, by that afternoon, all these roofing companies were showing up, offering free uh, uh, insurance claims 
that they could get you a new roof and you wouldn't have to pay a dime. And it was, uh, it was uh, in fact, one of them in our little town opened up a shop that next week to start having insurance claims, I guess because it was such a bad hailstorm. And I can just imagine this hailstorm here, it is the worst ever. If you were outside in that, it would really hurt. You would not want to be in the open air when a hailstorm like that comes. It would, uh, I, mean, I don't know if it would kill you, but it would, you know, you'd be bruised up getting hit by those pebbles. And God is telling Pharaoh, you're about to experience tomorrow. If you do not let my people go, if you don't allow my people to repent and to come worship me on the mountain, you're about to, your whole country is about to be destroyed. And it didn't destroy your home, but it put dents all over the car, cracked windshields, uh, uh, vinyl siding was destroyed, roof was destroyed, and obviously insurance paid for it. But back then, Bible times, they didn't have that. So you didn't have the insurance. So all of a sudden, if something was destroyed by what the insurance company folks call an act of God, then uh, you were responsible yourself to fix it and repair it. Well, that's what they're about to get, the worst hell storm ever. And sure enough, it's going to happen. Pharaoh does not turn from his sin. He's questioning. He is, the Bible even says he was an arrogant man. An arrogant man is a man or woman that will not listen. Even when they know what they're doing is wrong, even when they know what they're doing isn't the right thing, they refuse to obey. They refuse to repent. They refuse to turn to the Lord. He is an arrogant person, possibly the most arrogant man that's ever lived here, this Pharaoh of Egypt, going through these ten plagues. But the Lord is at work. God's word says, Therefore give orders to bring your livestock and all that you have in the fields into shelters. Every person and animal that is in the field and not brought inside will die when the hell falls on them. So this hell storm was so bad, you had to come inside or you would die. Now, where did this livestock come from? Well, uh, remember, death of all the livestock had died, but the livestock in Goshen, in northern Israel, was not dead. So, and there was also, Israel could have got neighboring countries' livestock and could have took the Hebrews' livestock. So we've got some new livestock here because all the previous livestock, two plagues earlier, the fifth plague, it had passed away. So God's warning says, you, you know, you've got a new batch of livestock, but if you want to save them, you need to bring your people along with the livestock inside. Keep going here in your Bible if you're following along. Those... Among Pharaoh's officials who feared the word of the Lord made their servants and livestock flee to shelters. For those who didn't take to heart the Lord's word left their servants and livestock in the field. So that means they're going to die. They did not listen to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven and let there be hell throughout the land of Egypt on people and animals and on every plant in the field. In the land of Egypt. So Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven. And the Lord sent thunder and hell. Lightning struck the land. And the Lord rained hell on the land of Egypt. The hell, with lightning flashing through it, was so severe that nothing like it had occurred in the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. Even today, probably, we haven't seen a hell storm like this. Throughout the land of Egypt, the hell struck down everything in the field, both people and animals. So if you were outside working in the field and that hailstorm came about, you would not have lived. The hell beat down every plant in the field and shattered every tree in the field. Even the trees died. The only place it didn't hell was in the land of Goshen where the Israelites were. So in northern Egypt there, along the Mediterranean Sea, where the Israelites and the Hebrews lived, it did not hell. The people were safe. No, no hell fell in that area. The livestock did not die. What livestock was left? That didn't get stolen from Egypt earlier. They were safe. Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron. I have sinned this time, he said to them. The Lord is the righteous one, and I and my people are the guilty ones. Make an appeal to the Lord. There has been enough of God's thunder in hell. I will let you go. You don't need to stay any longer. Meaning, it's, it's over at this point. I understand hell has devastated our country. Egypt 
took a hit. Many people have died. Our livestock has died. The trees, the crops, there's nothing left. And it's time for you, I, and even Pharaoh says, I now know the Lord. I've sinned. You need to go and repent. You know, there's two types of confession. Confession, when you get caught, many times is a sham confession. Meaning you got caught. You don't want the consequences. You're sad and sorry because all of a sudden, in this case, Everything that the hell landed on died, including the people. There was a lot of death. Livestock, trees, produce, gone. Nothing left. Plants. Everything's been killed. But then there's other types of confession, and that's when you are remorseful and you realize you've sinned against God. Here, Pharaoh's confession is one that he doesn't like the consequences. He does not like what's happening in his, his country. So he sees the consequences from the Lord, and he refuses to, or he, he's, he, he claims he's going to repent, but he actually refuses to repent. Moses says to him, verse 29, When I have left the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease and there will be no more hell, so that you may know the earth belongs to the Lord. But as for you and your officials, I know that you still do not fear the Lord God. Moses knew, I don't believe you. Even though I'm going to stretch my hand out, even though we're going to go through this again, even though we're going to play this game, Pharaoh, you don't believe me. You don't trust the Lord. You just don't want the consequences. You know, this is like the man who got caught cheating on his wife or who got caught with fornication, with adultery, with inappropriate things that were outside of God's, God's design and plan and purpose. And he got caught, so he repents. But he himself is actually not sorry. He's sorry that he got caught. He's sorry for the consequences, but there's no change of heart. And God is looking for you and I. True biblical saving faith is we repent not because we got caught. We don't repent because we want to go to heaven. We repent because we are sorry for our sin. And we realize God is a holy, perfect God, and we need to turn and trust in Him. God is calling us to make Him our Lord of our life, to trust in our lives as Jesus is our Savior. Is Jesus your Savior? Have you trusted in Him? The repentance that you turned to place your faith in the Lord, was it a saving repentance that you turned from your sin and turned to the Lord? The flax and the barley were destroyed because the barley was ripe. And the flax was budding, but the wheat and the spelt were not destroyed since they were later crops. So not all the crops died at this point. Moses left Pharaoh in the city and spread out his hands to the Lord. Then the thunder and the hell ceased. I mean, notice that God, that God allowed it Moses' hand. He stretched out his hands before the city, for the nation. And it stopped. The land, there was no more. When Pharaoh saw that the rain, hell, and the thunder had ceased, he sinned again and hardened his heart. Don't miss this phrase here. It says he sinned again. It is actually a sin to tell God you are going to repent and then go back to your old life. You're lying to the Lord. You've told God you're not going to do it anymore. You've changed. It's hypocrisy. Christ is calling us. He's calling you for your life. You make a promise, a commitment to the Lord. You give God your vow. You uphold it. So Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he did not let the Israelites go, as the Lord had said through Moses. He did not do it. Think about your last time you repented of your sin. Have you ever repented of a sin? you ever confessed something that in fact you didn't really change? Biblical salvation is placing your faith in Jesus Christ and turning from your sin. Have you done that? He sinned again and hardened his heart. There are so many folks, maybe you're watching, you're listening, and you have sinned again. 
You made a promise to God. You gave an oath. You gave them your word, and you did not keep it. Do you know today, 77 years ago, was D-Day. When we went in, 77 years, we went into that beach there in Normandy. And that began, began the end of the Second World War. It's how we entered and started to end. We pushed back against Hitler, pushed back against Germany, against the Nazi forces 77 years ago. Many of those men and women probably made promises and commitments to the Lord on that beach there at Normandy as they went into France, to free France, one country at a time. Take back the good guys. They maybe made promises to the Lord, but then they went back on their promise. They went back home, came back to America when the war was over and realized, hey, everything's fine. But I bet there was a lot of men and women that were in those trenches. And they made a promise to the Lord they were going to make it alive. It was a brutal battle. World War II. Hundreds of thousands of Americans died. They made that promise and they come back to the country. Come back from Europe. And they kept their word. God is looking for you and I to be the opposite of Pharaoh where we keep our word. Pharaoh's word meant nothing. God had to show by his mighty hand, by the hand of the Lord, that he was the Lord. And we don't want God to have to use his hand against us to teach us that he's the Lord. God is calling for us to trust and obey and believe and repent and to keep our word. We can't do it on our own. We have to have faith and belief in Jesus. Jesus can help you with your repentance. If you're struggling with sin... All you have to do, I don't want to make it too simple, because in many ways it's not simple, it's hard. Repentance is a daily commitment that you aren't going back to your old way of life. You've left Egypt. You're no longer like Pharaoh. In many ways, Pharaoh's officials understood. They did understand the power of the Lord, but not Pharaoh. Pharaoh represents the lost man today. He says something, but when things get better, he goes back to how it is. The man who gets saved, the man who restores his marriage, the man who gets his job back, and then he goes back to the pig pen. I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to King Jesus. He wants you to repent and turn from your sin. It's a personal message. Think about it. Have you sinned that second time, just like verse 34 says? He sinned again again in hardness heart. By going back against his word was a sin against the Lord. A hardened heart is sin. God wants to break your hardened heart. If you give him your word, you keep your word. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. I want you to pray with me. If you want to get saved, if you want to repent of your sin, you want Jesus Christ, the Lord of your life. You don't have to go through the, the pain that Pharaoh went through. Wouldn't it have been nice right at the beginning? All Pharaoh had to do that before even any of these plagues even started. Pharaoh had to say, yeah, y'all going out to the wilderness for a three-day journey, worship the Lord, and come on back. Do you know, if Pharaoh had did that, they would, they would he'd go, come back and there would have been slaves there in Egypt. Maybe to this day. Still in Goshen. But that, God knew Pharaoh's heart. He knew he had a hard heart. And God knows our hearts. And he's looking for our hearts to keep our word, to repent and believe in Jesus. I want you to bow your, head, bow your head, close your eyes, raise your hand. And I want you to receive Jesus this evening. Dear Jesus, you pray along with me. I have sinned. I have a hardened heart. I turn from my wicked ways. Lord, soften my heart. Help me believe. Lord, you're my God. I give you my life. From this day on, I'm yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want you to look up. Have you trusted in Christ as your Savior? If you have, you reach out to us here. And we'll be getting in touch with you and let you know your next steps in following Christ. Your first step is placing your faith in Jesus, repenting of your sins. Your next step is in believer's baptism. And that's an opportunity for you to make it public. Publicly say, I have repented 
That's my old self going under the water and my new self coming up. God bless you. I'll see you next week. We meet here every Sunday evening. It's Sunday night church. We are online. We are going through the ten plagues. We are studying the life of Moses. You meet here at six o'clock. You open up your Bibles and you allow God's powerful word to change you. This is what, this is what America needs. This is what you need. This is, uh, this is our hope, what's in these words. This is God's word to us. And we need to be diligent and faithful in studying it. God bless you. I will see you next Sunday.